Can your investments have a positive impact on the world? At Standard Chartered, we believe money can be a force for good. Through your sustainable investments with us, we're financing hospitals that are the heartbeat of local communities, funding clean energy to make electricity more accessible, and investing in innovative solutions to clean polluted marine habitats. Sustainable investments that benefit you and parts of the world that need it most. We're Standard Chartered, and we're here for good. Hello and welcome. You're watching Standard Chartered's Global Credit Markets Conference 2021. I'm Anisha Tank, your host for the next panel, Together Forever, finding innovative solutions to support critical infrastructure in Africa. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our panel to you and you will be seeing them on your screen right now. Uh, but first, a few little moments of housekeeping for you. On your screens, you will see that there is an icon which allows you to join in our question and answer session. If you send in your questions, if you are inspired by something you hear on the panel, please do so any time during the conversation. And those questions will be sent to me, and I will weave them into the conversation and put them to our panelists today. And we are really looking forward to hearing from you. So do let us know who you are, and we can share your opinions, your experiences, uh, but also your inquiries with the rest of the world. We have a global audience today, lots of participants, so let's get cracking. So on the basis of this subject, uh, we know that COVID-19 has touched every country in the world and definitely every country in sub-Saharan Africa. And that means that there have been some major economic challenges in the past year or so. But many economists agree that one major countermeasure to that for the future will be building out Africa's infrastructure. And we're seeing seeing this happen at a regional as well as an individual country level. If we look forward past the pandemic to our hopes to get through these difficult times, we can see that there's much opportunity from building out this infrastructure that we're speaking about. And it will positively impact people's lives on the ground, but also it would be of benefit to investors who want to make sure they're putting their money behind something that will have a positive impact for years to come. So let's crack on and introduce our panel that uh, will be able to offer some great insight into this subject. We have with us representing the government of Angola, Mr. Otonio dos Santos, who is the Secretary of State for Finance and Treasury in the Republic of Angola. Thank you so much for joining us today. Also from the World Bank, Shabnam Errol Madan, who is the Practice Manager for the Infrastructure Finance and Guarantees Group there uh, and works very closely in this area of infrastructure in Africa, bringing the reassurances of the insurance industry to the conversation from the ATI, Benjamin Mugusha, uh, Mugisha, excuse me, who is the Chief Underwriting Officer, Africa Trade Insurance Agency, and to help us understand the regulatory framework, how it's evolving and how we may have to evolve our thinking around it. Madhavi Gosavi, who is the partner of Norton Rose Fulbright LLP. And finally, from Standard Chartered, we have with us Alpha Kilic, who is the global head of project and export finance. So that is our highly esteemed panel. Let's crack on with the conversation. And I would like to take it, first of all, to real experiences on the ground. What is it like? What are the infrastructure needs? Let's begin with you, Mr. Dos Santos. Perhaps you can enlighten us as to what are the sort of thoughts, hopes, and aspirations you have when you think about building out your country's infrastructure? What are the challenges and what are the opportunities? Thank you very much uh, um, for, for, for your question. Um, first of all, I would like to, to, to say thank you also for, for this invitation. And on behalf of Mr. Madame uh, Minister Vera Davis de Souza, I would like to to thank you for this uh, invitation. Uh, it's important to highlight that um, Angola's infrastructure um, is a key priority for the Angola government uh, in the reconstruction and uh, rebuilding of the country. Um, as we seek to, the, to diversify our economy, uh, we think about 
infrastructure development as um, one of the key sectors that needs to grow and uh, which is essential to, to the country for the development of uh, other uh, economic uh, economics area. I would say that we uh, used to be an exporter of some um, products of agriculture, for instance, that uh, we need to, 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 to look at and uh, try to um, to be able to come uh, again uh, on these um, uh, practices. Uh, but having said that, um, um, it's uh, consensual that um, we will need, we still need um, uh, to implement major necessary uh, projects uh, in the country, uh, particularly in the key sectors such as uh, transportation, uh, social work, uh, for instance, uh, electricity, drink water, hospitals and educational facilities, and also uh, telecommunication um, uh, that lacks investments and uh, face some challenges on, on being maintained. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have some major challenges uh, that we are addressing to, to, to launch some major projects uh, such as um, um, a stable microeconomic situation as well as um, a, a trustworthy uh, policy and a legal framework, um, focusing also on the quality of gap relating to the needs of uh, bankable projects and um, a bankable environment and also for a skilled human capital and finally, uh, promoting the developing of the best international framework uh, references, um, multilateral sets of uh, principles and um, standard of, uh, uh, for instance, G20, for example, uh, to support Angola's economy, uh, long-term interest, um, financing and technological uh, sustainability and uh, other measures. Uh, so. I would say that these are um, uh, the main challenges that uh, we are facing and what we uh, believe that are the main sectors that we want to uh, address our investment on uh, infrastructure. Yeah, Mr. Dos Santos, obviously there is a long list of challenges there. Uh, and one of the challenges which I think you've touched upon briefly there has been around that financing gap. We know how much it takes uh, to build out infrastructure, but there is still that gap in financing. How serious is it of an issue is that for Angola? Yes, um, it's it's actually um, is a challenge that we is a challenge that we have to to, to face as uh, many countries in the in the continent and also I would think that um, every every countries that um, uh, would like to finance uh, projects big projects like like uh, this one um, um, we have uh, in some uh, specific areas uh, such as electricity and water sector um, uh, we have projects that are very um, um, uh, important for, for for our government uh, for instance uh, hydropower generation project projects uh, for uh, like uh, Kakulu Kabasta in Lauka, uh, which is valued at um, more than four billion dollars, and um, all other uh, projects like um, uh, hydro uh, uh, thermal electricity projects, which is a hybrid uh, project, which is uh, valued at uh, one point two point one billion dollars. Sorry. Uh, and finally, um, one project for water production, transportation uh, by the pipeline, stock and distribution, called it the project, which is valued uh, more than one billion dollars. So we have uh, uh, these projects on the on the electricity and water sector, but also in different other sectors such as uh, transportation uh, sector, uh, with the transport sector, um, which we have um, um, a project. Uh, for the new international airport valued at 1.4 billion dollars as well, um, uh, which is um, um, uh, mainly um, um, pointed as being able to, to have more than 50 million passengers and 50,000 tons of uh, merchandise. So uh, we uh, have uh, with only three or four projects um, uh, a needs for more than 10 or uh, 10 billion dollars. Uh, it's not easy to, to a country to have all this money at once. So uh, it's needed to first prioritize the projects and then find uh, the, 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 the main solutions and the best solutions to, to finance those projects as well.
And that's exactly why we're here, to discuss exactly what those solutions are. Thank you so much for uh, helping us see this picture. And based on that, let's pick up with you, Shabnam, of course, you're someone who operates at the confluence of a number of agencies, really, that are trying to pick up this baton and run with it and address some of these challenges from a multilateral perspective. How do you do it? Thank you for the question, Manisha. The challenge indeed is great, and the financing gap is large, especially when we factor into climate resilience and other needs um, into the, in addition to the individual projects. Um, it's a range of challenges, really. Uh, when you look at African governments, clearly credit profiles are not quite where you'd want them to be. Typically, they are rated low investment grade in the single B area, or some of them are not rated. And they're also more susceptible to volatilities in the market, be it financial or otherwise. When we look at the individual sectors also, some of them tend to be nascent, progressing, but still under development. Revenues are not often sufficient to meet the cost of individual sectors, and there's usually work that is being done in that area, often in parallel to projects being prepared and form formulated. And hand in hand with this goes SOE creditworthiness, which is another important area. Private sector, when they come into contracts, they of course look through to see who is their counterpart what sort of financial and uh, governance risks are they taking? These are all important. And of course, we're looking to build more track record in Africa with the private sector. In, uh, in, in energy sector, there is a certain track record. We've seen good progress, for example, in the area of renewables over the last number of years. But we would like to expand that to other sectors as well, which are in desperate need of private capital and investment. And that brings up the topic, of course, of PPP frameworks, a public investment management, prioritizing the right projects, selecting them, preparing them, negotiating them well with the presence of capable advisors. Um, there are a number of ways to get past them. The bank, of course, focuses um, in its engagement with countries beyond an individual project. Our engagement spans multiple sectors from macro to micro engagements at different levels. Um, and I'd like to, for example, commend the uh, Angolan government here. Uh, we are, of course, also very present in Angola, and it was the proactiveness of the Ministry of Finance, which I think is making a big difference in terms of um, having a roadmap to address some of the challenges on the ground. Um, in terms of um, uh, these challenges, I think the biggest part is really the government's own efforts in terms of putting in place reforms, be it at the macro fiscal level, but also sector level. For example, in Angola, we supported them uh, through a development policy financing. We have an advisory engagement on SOA credit worthiness and governance, as well as PPP frameworks at the request of the government of Angola. And we're working on a number of uh, investment projects as well as various sector engagements looking at sector reform. It's this comprehensive approach that will be critical in overcoming these challenges. In addition to that, of course, the bank offers this uh, guarantee program, which since its inception has mobilized something like 40 billion of capital. A good chunk of this has been in Africa over a, a third. And we look to expand that to support more African governments working hand in hand alongside the necessary reforms to put in place the right enabling conditions. And I think there is also a big role here for, um, for investors and lenders to make sure they have the patience. And I really like the standard chartered logo here for good. It's these types of commercial banks that we need with the patience and the understanding of the conditions on the ground to work with the governments, with the World Bank, with the advisors, with reinsurers like ATI, to put in place these uh, these innovative financings. Yes. And again, I think another important thing is partnership with uh, reinsurers, with investors, the likes of ATI, in bringing these to market in a, in a risk-reward allocation that's acceptable to investors. Yeah, and I was just going to jump in there and say, Shabnam, thank you for teeing up my next question so well, which is to go and speak to the ATI. Let's check in with Benjamin, because we've obviously heard a lot here uh, from Shabnam about 
managing risk for you know investors and giving them a better outlook we are talking about innovating in this space what is it the ati has been doing and what difference does it make having the ati part of those collaborations and partnerships thank you very much um so the african trade insurance agency represents so is you know part of another class of investors who very often sit at the back of transactions and do not come to the front so um, everyone is familiar with the options on the investment and trade side with regard to equity or debt um, you know investments but very often sitting behind these debt or equity investments is a class of investors who have put forward a risk capital as well to you know share some of this risk uh, and very often because they are insurers or underwriters they are not at the fore of these transactions so the African Trade Insurance Agency as an, an African multilateral has been very active on the continent, uh, first of all, as a multilateral owned by predominantly African governments, having a real discussion very similar to what you've had um, from the World Bank in terms of understanding what are the priorities of every country, what is the strategy going forward in the medium term and short term, and how can we actually allocate capacity in the way that maximizes return uh, on transactions. So very broadly speaking, one of the things that the African Trade Insurance Agency achieves for this continent is to mobilize private capital uh, in the form of reinsurance to support transactions in what would very often be emerging markets or would actually be markets where there is, yes, there is a level of familiarity, but the level of familiarity has been narrowed down to either the Ministry of Finance or key state-owned enterprises that have a track record. I mean, in Angola, that would be the likes of Solangol. And yet there would be a government strategy to widen, you know, uh, the access of these institutions and, of course, the economy to private sector capital. So in order to help the process where private capital in the form of either equity or debt flows into the continent where trade is improved, ATI is at the forefront of that process from the insurance perspective. And to give you some hard numbers, you know, on an annual basis, uh, we support close to six point, you know, five billion dollars worth of transactions in Africa. We do that, um, you know, by mobilizing this private sector capital in the form of reinsurance behind us. In fact, typical on a net basis, if you look at our, you know, 2020 uh, statements we would show, or annual reports, you would see that We've done this with ATI's participation in the range of about a billion dollars. So close to five points, you know, five billion, there about, you know, over five billion has been mobilized from the private market, sitting behind an, an African multilateral that understands the market that is what, you know, access to debt and equity in these markets. And that's, I think, where the real story from an insurance perspective lies, that working together with all our partners, whether it's um, commercial banks, whether it's other multilaterals, and in this case, uh, multilaterals that provide um, guarantee products such as the World Bank, how we can structure these together, how we can provide blended guarantees at the front of maybe, uh, at the back of blended finance, uh, to achieve for each dollar the maximum output. Whether this translates into benefits to countries in the forms of tenors achieved, pricing uh, on transactions, or even, you know, how we can look at, for example, from a COVID perspective, the long, medium to long-term outlook for Africa going through a very tough uh, period, uh, maybe the first in 20 years, to actually allow, uh, as has been mentioned, appetite to really uh, take advantage of the opportunities of on the continent, all challenges notwithstanding. So, from ATI's perspective, this is really where the value add comes in on the continent, a market in which we operate, we only operate in Africa, mobilizing private capital at the back of our own capital. We have, you know, from a leverage perspective, a very high leverage where with an equity base of about 440 million at the moment, 410 million rather at the moment, we are able to achieve six or seven billion worth of investments on an annualized basis. That's really where the value add is and where we think the future lies in terms of collaboration together, but also with uh, the private sector to 
maximize benefits for the continent. Well, there's certainly a lot that is we can be enthusiastic about and excited about there. But let's come back to that because I want to talk about some of those numbers again a little bit later. Before we do, though, let's check in with Madhvi. I think it was really interesting there, Madhvi, that we've had the, the picture painted for us of just what the needs are. But we are seeing the, our thinking around these needs evolve. We understand the urgency to get a lot of this infrastructure built, but we're still up against all of these challenges that our panelists so far have outlined. And there is this discrepancy. We just heard from Benjamin there that, yes, the ATI's involvement is bringing in much higher levels of capital. But as we heard from Mr. Dos Santos earlier, we're talking just in one country about the requirement of tens of billions of dollars for infrastructure projects. You have wide experience, Madhvi. You've seen this in a number of emerging market economies. Just give us your perspective on quite how fast we need to move this along. Uh, thank you, Manisha. That's uh, that's a good question. I think uh, for the kind of investment that is needed in Africa, we need to move very, very quickly, uh, and the African governments need to move very quickly. But I think from what I'm seeing across uh, the African space, and take Angola, for example, African governments are realizing that unless there is a stable um, and solid regulatory framework, uh, things are not going to change quickly. And um, you know, it's not simply enough for economies to, to, to grow. If these economies have to transform if African governments ha can you know, need to develop the kind of infrastructure and the kind of investment that they, they, they need in these countries. I think uh, uh, we are seeing that, that change coming through. Taking Angola, for example, in the last three years, we have seen a huge spate of regulations, right from ESG to ABC to uh, procurement. Uh, and also, as Shabna mentioned earlier, a, a PPP framework has been put in place. And you know, this has happened only in the last four years. These regulations are based on uh, European models, international models. And I'm seeing that across the piece in, in Africa. You know, take, take Uganda, for example. They've delivered a, a very ambitious get fit program, Egypt Solar, the solar program in Morocco. Kenya has had a huge development in the last 10 years. And that's only been possible because they have put in place a, a, all the changes that are needed to actually attract international investment. So I think uh, the changes that we are seeing are transformational, Manisha, and uh, African governments are committed to making that change, and we're seeing that quite a lot. Which is definitely very encouraging. With that, I want to take it to ALPA, um, because, of course, ALPA, Standard Chartered, has always been very strong in Africa and is very much out there in terms of many of the global financial institutions um, working with a number of the local governments in sub-Saharan Africa. Perhaps you can just update us on some of the work that you've been doing with your teams. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you, Manisha. Uh, before that, uh, I, I wanted to share a, uh, a couple of figures uh, with you and with the audience, and, and hopefully it will um, help with the context uh, a bit more. So, um, Last year, 2020 uh, year-end numbers, uh, the total financing that uh, was utilized uh, in project financing globally, right? And by project financing, I refer to the non-recourse limited recourse transactions, that that amount doesn't include the amounts that are directly borrowed by the government. That amount was $370 billion. Um, about 11 percent lower than the figure uh, in 2019. This is the result of COVID. But $370 billion of, uh, uh, dollars of financing went to the projects across the world. Uh, around 50 percent of that number uh, is utilized for uh, in the renewable sector for power renewables. Uh, and uh, apologies, around 50% for power and 70% of that 50% is renewables. I guess the, the, the point being significant amount of uh, financing supported by the banks, by DFIs, by uh, institutional investors are utilized for renewable transactions. Now, on one hand, this is great uh, because we are a party to it. We are supporting that transition. 
Uh, on the other hand, we need the same support, uh, same level of, um, I suppose, achievement in other sectors. Now, globally, when we look at the infrastructure requirements, by 2030, the infrastructure requirement is around $7 trillion. And again, ex we expect that around 45 to 50% of that amount will uh, be utilized in the emerging markets. So, and Africa it will play a very, very significant role. Now, banks like us have a big role to play. Uh, I, I see that, you know, because of our uh, understanding uh, in uh, emerging markets, our relationship with our clients, uh, governments, developers, contractors, uh, banks play a very important role to coordinate, to be an agent, if you will, bringing the parties together, uh, that is with other banks, uh, investors, uh, SOEs, uh, DFIs and MDBs. So we play a significant role to help uh, close that gap. Uh, and and we, can, we can certainly, I can certainly say that that's the role that we've been uh, playing in Standard Chartered Bank. Now, yes, of course, there are challenges. I think, uh, you know, it's been addressed by Mr. Dos Santos and Shebnam and Madvi and Ben. But the, uh, the, the name of this panel is quite telling, Together Forever. The solution is also in this panel. Banks coming together with multilateral development banks and DFIs and uh, 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 institutional investors, private investors, private investment facilitators like ATI. Uh, of course, uh, you know, to do that, we need the legal uh, framework uh, in Africa to improve. Of course, the bankability of the projects uh, should improve. Shebnam referred to the risk rating of those countries. At the end of the day, for investors, it's all about risk and return. But the group of uh, institutions who are represented in this panel is absolutely the solution. So I would like to refer to a one uh, project, uh, and I would like to conclude that at least this, this first round. Uh, we have worked uh, together uh, to support a project in Angola. Government of Angola led a project, PETA. It's a portable uh, water project quite a large project to the tune of a billion dollars. Uh, it has been, a, it has taken a while for all of us to get together, uh, bring our resources together to find a solution. Uh, we are almost there. Uh, uh, I wish I could say that we have actually closed the transaction. Had this panel been a week later, probably, you know, we would be able to say that. We are, we are very close. And everybody in this panel together worked towards a solution which was a very challenging start. And yet, uh, with our collective power, uh, financial uh, capabilities, uh, 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 and advisory capabilities, uh, we managed to find a solution. And I'm very, very hopeful that for Angola, as well as many other uh, sub-Saharan African markets, this will provide a, an opportunity for us to replicate, to move on to the other sectors, and then help governments to cover that infrastructure gap that I referred up front. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, Alpa, you've underlined there that innovative solutions come from partnership and they come from collaboration. But something I'm also picking up from all of our panelists, from all of you, is willingness as well. And I think, Shabnam, it was you who mentioned it. You talked about the proactivity of the Angolan government. Mr. Dos Santos, can I just check in with you? And let's just talk about that proactivity and where the impetus for it comes from. Can you speak a little bit to that culture of leadership and the push forward and why and how much these innovative solutions, but making it a priority so much drives your agenda and is driving your hope for the future? It's very important that all nations try and push for that and it seems to me that Angola is giving us a very good example of it. Perhaps you can talk a little bit about where it comes from and that drive to build this infrastructure, obviously quickly, uh, but to get these partnerships on board as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your question. I think that 
uh, one thing that we have uh, um, in, 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 in our agenda is to leave something uh, good to the next generation. Uh, I, I, I think that we are um, uh, the next generation of the, 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 the generation that came be, before of us. Uh, uh, and we uh, believe that uh, is, is is what um, Angola government is is, is, is looking to achieve. Uh, and uh, as I said and very well said um, um, uh, by uh, by Alper, uh, we are uh, looking um, forward uh, and we are doing uh, it now, um, um, engaging with a lot of partners multilateral. Uh, uh, banks, uh, banks, and also insurance uh, entities to 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 stabilize. Um, 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 I would say the correct framework in which um, all the the infrastructures could be built, and also could uh, provide the the um, I would say the add value to to not only for the specific sector water. Uh, transport or, or energy or other um, 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 uh, sectors, but also uh, doing, um, uh, as as we say, um, the um, uh, 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 I would say the the, the best uh, uh, valuation for uh, add value. I would say to to uh, different sectors as well. So that's why we believe that starting uh, uh, the the. In the right, with the right food, uh, could uh, be in, in very important to 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 take the place uh, where we want to go. Um, uh, our elders used to say uh, that uh, if you want to go fast, you go uh, alone. But if you go, if you want to go further, you go with your partner. So that that is uh, some kind of principle that uh, we we have here. And uh, this example of uh, what we're trying to do, uh, also in this project beta, is uh, is, uh, is something that uh, we believe that could uh, be a win-win solution, as uh, we used to say. And Mr. Dos Santos, can I just ask you? And economists sometimes point this out. Uh, that there are different rates of movement, whether you're talking about an individual country such as your, uh, such as, an, as in Angola or a regional movement. What sort of conversations do you have with your regional counterparts? Yes, uh, uh, we have a southern, uh, 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 we have a lot of, um, 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 I would say, um, um, uh, groups uh, or uh, um, that in, in which Angola is part uh, in, uh, like um, uh, SADEC, um, uh, uh, and also the the the, the Great uh, Lake um, uh, countries, and um, uh, in which we uh, um, actually engage with uh, those countries in order to be able to to face the challenges that in a region. In our region, we we, we have to face. Um, in in Sadek specifically, they were uh, approved uh, by the the, the government uh, in uh, in Sadek uh, to create, for instance, a, a, a fund, a development fund that could uh, be um, used to um, uh, finance uh, some projects in specific uh, uh, areas in, uh, in, 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 in the countries <clears throat> that are in the, in the, in the, in the region. So uh, those examples are the examples that um, uh, we, we, we believe that um, as a whole could be uh, used to, to, to be as a foundation to create um, more and more um, um, projects to be financed in the, in a region uh, is, um, is is important to say also that actually uh, each country has to approve by the national assembly. Uh, we actually manage to, uh, to to do uh, uh, to do it in uh, in our part. I would say in Angola. Uh, um, we are f looking to to have this approved by our parliament right now uh, to 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 make the um, uh, the subscription and ratificate the the 
um, disagreement. But we believe that uh, this is something that we have to face as we want uh, to, to go uh, further. Thanks so much for that. Um, I'm at this stage going to bring in a question from our audience, actually. This has been sent in by Bertie Lombard. Generally, Africa will continue to be on the cusp of investor appetite, he says. Risk on when global yields are low and risk off when they are not. Innovation required to capture some of the more targeted opportunities will come at elevated risk for investors. And we did address uh, some of the risk issues a little bit earlier in the conversation. So what does innovation need to look like to address this challenge? Um, Shabnam, I'm going to put that to you because in your last answer, we did start to talk about risk. And then maybe, Benjamin, you can also give us your view. But Shabnam, first of all, uh, what does innovation need to look like to address that challenge? Um, thank you, Manisha. Um, innovation, I think, can take uh, can take many forms. Um, I think what I mentioned earlier, and, and risk is a big part of this, I can see the question is very much linked to risk. <laughs> I think what we need to address here is, as we innovate, how do we de-risk? So we could innovate through bringing in institutional investors, through bringing in reinsurance, looking at programmatic approaches, which might de-risk uh, some of the challenges along the way, scaling approaches, which could reduce time to market. But I think at the core of it, as we are de-risking, and in that I'm also referring to ATI, MEGA, IFC, ourselves, other multilaterals, we de-risk through providing credit enhancement, but also working with governments especially in the case of the multilaterals, supporting them in their own ambitions and in their own vision to put in place the right sort of regulation, the right sort of reforms, so that we de-risk the environment, the country's environment as a whole. I think the two will need to go hand in hand. And what we always like to see is that we might come into a sector, to a project with a credit guarantee. Perhaps it covers... 40%, 60% of the risk. Um, we'd like to see that reduced over time and the need for any kind of credit enhancement to eventually go away. This is the aim here. Um, I, I see the, the, the guarantees or the risk mitigation almost as training wheels to help innovate, to bring investors to this market so that they can also get to know the countries, their environment, build the relationships, build the track record, familiarize their credit desks with the types of risks. Um, but, but in the medium to long run, they can just build on that experience and carry on without credit enhancement and support from the likes of the World Bank. Okay, thanks. Let me stop here. Thanks for addressing that that one. And, and in fact, there's, there's yet another question on risk. And I think what's very interesting with the question that we've had from Nana Baidu, which I'm about to read out, is that it actually goes deeper into breaking down where some of this money is flowing, where the finances are flowing uh, in terms of the different types of critical infrastructure that we're talking about. So Nana makes the point that, and I cannot verify these figures, but this is what Nana says, less than 6% of bank lending goes to agriculture, seemingly because it's seen as risky and returns are too low and sporadic to support large investments such as agricultural infrastructure. Now, this question goes on to talk about how different industries benefit further down the value chain and how there is obviously a differential. So culminating in innovative models which look at repayment from all of these other value level beneficiaries needs to be developed. I think really this question is around how we see that framework evolve a little bit further. Benjamin, perhaps you can take that one, and I'm sure Madhvi, you have a view on this as well, but Ben, perhaps you could go first in response. Thank you. Um, it's a very good question because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's realized, it's recognized that agriculture is the backbone um, of most African economies, you know, whether it's the support for the informal sector, whether it is actually productive uh, employment uh, and the opportunities to take advantage of the resources themselves of the continent are immense. And I think this links into the earlier comments around innovation, where, you know, in order to overcome the challenges, whether it's real or perceived, 
in the agricultural space, what can be done. So there is, you know, a lot of work that's being done, and ATI is part of uh, the discussions in that space, in how can, you know, technology be integrated into the production side of agriculture, whether it is everything from climate finance products, you know, both insurance and lending, uh, whether it is actually aggregate uh, programs to try and put, uh, you know, mass economies of scale into uh, what is very often subsistence level uh, production, and that's, you know, both on the crop side as well as on the animal side. So there's a lot of work that we participate in to try and see how we can actually try and innovate using technology, using everything that has come up with digitalization and satellite uh, technology to try and develop um, models that allow, you know, specific flows of capital into that part of the, se of the agricultural sector. And then we're also looking to move away from that because at least, you know, one of the things I can say is ATI will also, pro you know, provide support in the private sector to see how we can then support supply chain financing. Everything from reverse factoring, where you say, you know, let's try and leverage the comfort that exists in these markets with anchor buyers or anchor, you know, wholesalers to try and feed back into uh, the SME space uh, by supporting supply chains to these uh, aggregators and seeing how this can then trickle, you know, back to the small and micro enterprise or even subsistence level, family level enterprises. So we do a lot of work also in that space trying to come up with products that allow the right capital flow into those areas by having a risk participant such as ourselves. And for this, we are looking at piloting in some of the markets that are you know, that, that have some framework in place. And, of course, the financial sector has to, a very big part to play. So, all in all, you know, the innovations in the agricultural space will be very necessary because it's the one sector that on the continent will continue to provide the backbone for, you know, for economic participation at all levels, right from the micro to the large scale. Now, yes, there might be challenges in very many countries, and every country will be different, difficult, uh, different on the continent. But then, with the opportunities that um, that exist, there's a very strong need to find the. It's very important to know that the DFIs will do their part. You know, so institutions like ourselves and some of the other panelists, uh, the World Bank, we will do our part. But the main aim will be to try and also find solutions that are sustainable. So to learn lessons that have worked in other countries that had similar challenges and apply them here. I just wanted to go back actually to the earlier question as well. It's not in agriculture, but just to give an example of how innovation works. Very often there will be a product that exists and works for large scale, large um, size transaction in the infra space. So we've seen that a lot, for example, in the renewable space. And then the question is, even without necessarily changing the wheel, you know, or inventing a new wheel, taking these lessons that have been learned on the continent at a larger scale and trying to see how you can fit them into a uh, smaller, medium-sized project. So even at ATI, for example, we do a lot of work in the small and medium-sized renewable space, taking products that are to a very large extent, a replication of, of, you know, products that worked in the much larger renewable space and saying, you know, obviously the transactional, um, you know, requirements re remain the same whether the project is large or small. So there was some disincentive to to do much more in the smaller, you know, scale space. But now we have these products that work very well in the larger scale space, and we actually apply them with a few tweakings, recognizing the nature of the investments, the nature of the contracts at play, etc. And that cannot be overlooked. And I think my last point on this whole question of transparency, because uh, it was quite clear that every uh, institution and every party has a role to play, and I think Sabine mentioned some of the work that has been done, one of the things that is starting to come out of uh, of Africa and, you know, Angola would be one of the countries that you can see this really coming to the fore is the issue of transparency because risk is very often perceived. Um, and in order for there to be a real distinction between the perception of risk in a particular country or the perception of risk in doing business with a particular government and the reality, there needs to be increased transparency. So I think Beyond the, you know, beyond the conversation around innovation, um, there's also the issue of 
you know, how much transparency is coming to the fore, how much confidence is being built. And as you have heard from Mr. Dos Santos, the governments themselves are really taking a, you know, a, a prime role in making sure that they recognize this need of the private sector, especially, and take the right measures to try and build this confidence, build this track record, and it's through these multiple, faceted, but interlinked, you know, uh, initiatives that you will then see innovation coming in. Because at the end of the day, the private sector is probably, you know, the key driver of innovation. Yes, we will play a role, but they will have, you know, a much wider footprint, wide much wider experiences. And as long as we can work together, provide risk mitigation where we can, provide solutions where we can have the interaction or act as a bridge in some cases, then I think the private sector can really participate in innovation because there is a risk participation from the right partners on transactions. Thank you. Uh, ben, I like this point that you're making yeah. about technology, and I want to take that a little bit further. Madhvi, um, obviously, there was to address this this issue over sort of the fairer allocation of finance, mitigating against the kind of perce perceived risk of, say, agricultural infrastructure, going back to that initial question from Nana. So perhaps you can respond on that. But also, I wanted to ask you about how much we can benefit from technology and innovation in the technological space in terms of the blockchain, for example, it's one thing to have a regulatory framework, but you want to know that things are working. You want to have transparency. You want to have a system through which you can deliver accountability. So I was curious about your views on that. But let's first start with this more efficient and more equitable allocation of finance. Can that be achieved through regulation? Uh, yes, certainly. I think, uh, Manisha, that's, uh, it can be achieved through regulation. Uh, for example, in a lot of the African countries, uh, there is uh, regulation which um, enables the private sector in investing uh, in, in the social side of things. So if you are developing a mega project, um, on the side of it, are you also investing in uh, the hospital sector or uh, how much of local training is built into your contracts? So Dr. Dos Santos, for example, earlier said there were these mega projects being delivered in Angola, the Takulokoba, Salauka. These are multi-billion dollar projects. Um, and and the, the benefit that flows through on the micro level from these mega projects should be in our local Africans, our local Angolans being given the training, being given the jobs, um, are the local uh, you know, tribes that are affected by these projects uh, being resettled, being given the compensation, the education actually to come out of poverty or to be resettled, whatever the issue is. So I think that that can be benefit benefiting to, to the population generally. Uh, Manisha, coming back to the agricultural point, um, I agree with uh, Nana that so far from the agri projects that we have seen across the piece in Africa, there is limited commercial bank investment. And I think the reason for that is because agriculture is it's got a huge human risk. You know, you've got food security, you've got people involved, and there is not enough uh, risk mitigation in there. And I think that's where institutions like the World Bank, like the DFIs can step in and actually help um, bring in the commercial capital. So we've seen some uh, development on the agri front in Angola. And again, that's been primarily institutions like the World Bank, like AFD actually helping out. Equally, I've seen mega projects being delivered in places like Kenya and Sierra Leone, where they're using large tracts of unused land with private sector money, obviously with the, you know, insurance in or uh, multilateral backing to it. Um, so they're, they're, agriculture is very much a headline agenda for, uh, for uh, many African governments, uh, especially given the resources there. Much as they need roads, airports, water, energy, basic infrastructure, you know, as Benjamin said, it's important to develop the, the agri front as well. Uh, in terms of uh, coming back to technology, uh, I think uh, unless there is a regulatory framework, you know, you, you can't actually build the technology, the technological innovation on, on, on top of that. So uh, I think for any kind of uh, technological innovation, you do need the basic uh, regulation to deliver that. 
Yeah, and on the subject of technology, let me take that a little bit further with you, Alpa. Um, in terms of facilitating innovation in this space, how much do you think about technology and how you will leverage it in, in your role? Absolutely. Thanks, Manisha. Uh, a couple of ways to look at this. Right? First of all, I guess it's all what is the what is the objective, right? The objective is to address the infrastructure investment gap. I think we talked about agriculture a little bit. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not only agriculture. At the moment, across emerging markets, and, and certainly sub-Saharan Africa is not any different to that, we know that the investor interest is heavily concentrated on renewable energy. Right? And the question is, why? Why are the investors and the banks and other parties are feeling more comfortable putting their money to the renewable sector and more so than the others. Agriculture is one of them, but there's other healthcare and education and transportation. We can bucket them under other category, if you will. And I guess the question is, what do we need to learn from the investments going into renewables and then apply them to the other sectors? And technology is certainly one of them. And I will highlight a couple of points, if, if I may. One is the objective, that this is the source of the you know, users, if you will. And at the moment, what we are seeing, what we are noticing abundantly is that there's a huge uh, preference by the investors on sustainable projects, sustainable infrastructure. Now, it is not a, it is not a, project for investors or it is not an initiative anymore. For all of us, it has become, sustainable financing has become a core part of our strategy. Therefore, investors will look at the underlying risks for those projects. The second one is the bankability, right? So how do we ensure that the projects are bankable? They can, um, uh, you know, uh, sustain the cash flow generation on their own uh, as such if an international investor is investing into that project, how will they ensure that the project will produce enough uh, revenue or cash flow to be able to serve the debt raise or help achieve the uh, investor's return uh, uh, requirements as such. Uh, within that, there's certainly the legal framework that uh, Madhavid had touched on, and then the risk uh, return balance that Shebnam has touched on. Right? And technology is in the heart of it. So one, one, one quick example I can highlight to is that Institutional investor funding and capital is absolutely a requirement in order to close the gap in emerging markets when it comes to infrastructure investments. Banks have been facing this with support from DFIs and multilateral development banks. But what we are noticing is that institutional investor risk return dynamics, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, it is still not at the desired level. In order to ensure that the institutional investor funding comes into the projects in sub-Saharan Africa, that risk return dynamics will, will have to be uh, uh, established. And one way to look at is securitization projects, right? So when we look at the underlying project cash flows and bringing them together in, you know, some sort of an uh, um, under an umbrella financing way, securitization vehicles are, are, are being utilized and becoming more common in other uh, emerging markets in Asia, for example. And we are seeing this. So technology is, again, a, a great way of uh, 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 allowing uh, institutional investors, uh, investors who may not be as familiar with African risk and African projects, and giving them the tools to understand the risk, bringing the risk mitigation mechanism under a workable structure so that that capital flows into the right countries, right projects, right transactions, and then therefore the gap is bridged. So, you know, we can talk more about that, but I, I think technology is one very important part of it, but there are other elements, as, as I highlighted as well, that we all need to work together if we want to close this gap. Thank very, you. very briefly, though, Alpa, on the subject of what technology can do for us, I think you've raised something very interesting there, which is that we see many different experiences between countries in sub-Saharan Africa. We're talking about a very, very large part of the world and lots of different projects, lots of different opportunities. It's 
you know, investors may be thinking about how do I get access to that knowledge? How do I understand this market better? Um, you know, in previous panels, we've talked about whether or not there should be standardization, whether or not we should have more access to data. Just from your perspective, how do you navigate all of the information that needs to be shared? Because, you know, a 60-minute panel isn't enough. Absolutely. And again, I think this, this panel, the core of this panel is very important for that. I refer to a project that we are about to finalize, very important project, infrastructure projects in Angola. And I indicated that, uh, you know, it has taken us a while. We have faced various challenges. Now, the critical piece for me is really, how do we replicate this? How do we take this forward when we look at the support that World Bank has provided to that transaction and the legal framework that has come together and the private insurance support that ATI has brought and the bank financing that we managed to put together? There has got to be a huge amount of learnings from them. And in order for us to move to the next project, as Mr. Santos mentioned in Angola, we need to be more agile. We have to use those lessons learned and put them in effect in a lot more efficient way so that we move on to the next uh, project uh, and therefore help the government of Angola and other sub-Saharan African markets for that matter to achieve that financing as a result of the structure that we've created. Now, standardization, absolutely. Uh, certainly, when you look at the banks coming together in a syndicated fashion, when you look at the uh, credit support provided by World Bank, when you look at the legal documentation that has taken us a while to agree upon, I think for me, what is very, very important is that we've done it once, right, in, in, this, in this example, and then we should be able to move on to the next deal and the next deal, and then broaden that a skill set and experience that we have collectively established to other investors and to other countries and to other projects. And that is the way that we can call this a real success. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I answered that question, but I'm, I feel pretty strong about that. I think the solution is there as long as we learn from our lessons and try to improve it with every single transaction going forward. Thank you. It makes complete sense. We have just under five minutes, so I want to get very brief answers from all of you. Mr. Dos Santos, I want to start with you first of all. We've talked about a lot of different angles on this story in this panel so far. Just finally and briefly, if you can, what has been the one major lesson that has come out of all of your experiences dealing with all of these wonderful partners who we've been talking about on this panel that really sets the tone for what comes next, the kind of message that you would share with your counterparts on the continent? Uh, thank you. Actually, I think that... Uh, um, um, I already mentioned uh, before in my previous, uh, um, 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 uh, when I, as I, I was saying before, because uh, what I feel is um, that, that um, if um, what our elders used to say, uh, this is something that we use a lot in, in Angola, in some country in Africa, uh, is that uh, if you want to go fast, you go go alone. If you want to go further, you go with your partners. Really, is what what happened here uh, with this project. So we had uh, we have a lot of uh, institutions and uh, participants in one project all together. It's like a dream team or something like Avengers. Uh, Avengers going together to to fight and and, 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 and bring uh, solutions for 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 a specific. Uh, challenge. So I believe that what will come next is something uh, that could be very close to what we achieve now and uh, to solve uh, other kind of uh, challenges that we will face and we have and we know that we have to face. What a great metaphor to use, the Avengers. Let's take it to Shabnam. Shabnam, I'm going to assume that you're one of the Avengers uh, over at the World Bank. Um, but what I want to ask you is what is the single most important attitude that you need to have to navigate this space? And do you ever see this financing gap close? If you had to put a number on it, what would you say? This is a very hard question to answer, Manisha. Um, I think the financing gap itself keeps growing. Um, I'm very encouraged to see interest 
uh, also increasing from institutional investors, from the reinsurance market, and of course from commercial lenders to help close this financing gap. What I'm most encouraged by is the long-term vision. Um, I think we see that now with the changes in the way banks are lending, investors are investing. We're also seeing it in governments who are leading the way with their own vision and commitment to reforms. I think these two combined is our main chance to close the financing gap. And of course, as MDBs, we're here to work with both parties um, and help pursue this uh, ambitious agenda. Thanks for that, Shabnam. Um, we are running really low on time. So, Benjamin, I'm going to ask you, could you just offer three words that describe your hopes for the next five to ten years in terms of funding uh, infrastructure and also finding those innovative solutions? Thank you. Thank you very much. If I was to go with any three words, I would probably go with blending, um, so everyone comes with something to the table, um, leverage, so work, sweat this asset that you have as much as you can with other participants and skin in the game. Everyone has skin in this game and is doing their part. Great stuff. Madhavi, what about you? What would be your three words to describe the landscape? Uh, I think uh, flexibility, uh, understanding, um, and uh, I think I've only got two words, Manisha, to be honest. But flexibility and understanding your market would be key. What can I say, Madhuri? Less is more. Thank you very much. Uh, Alpa, I think it would be only right, uh, our host, Standard Chartered, can we just have a final word from you? I think this has been a great example of partnership, collaboration, and a great deal of positivity in, in a word. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. It, it's been wonderful. And my two words to you, Manisha, will be together forever. <laughs> we, know that the gap, we know that the gap is there, but I'm also certain that we will be able to close that if we work together and if we work in a sustainable way in a, with a long-term uh, vision. Uh, we will overcome the challenges. The requirements are there. There is no lack of capital in the world. And we have all the ingredients to make it happen. Thank you. Excellent stuff. You've left me just three seconds to say thank you to all of our panelists today. I'm Anita Tank. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.